Good morning. Entering a new marine era for gas. Let's take a look at what this means to the industry, what the key drivers are, and the reasons behind this entire new wave of, of interest. Presentation will take about 10 minutes. We'll hope to have some uh, good questions. And I look forward to having any uh, discussions shortly afterwards. When we talk to owners, they say gas sounds great. But where do I get it? What's it going to cost? Can I really use this fuel? Because I have to be in business and run my ships. Payload is what's important to me. So they've often said that this is the chicken and the egg problem. I haven't got gas and it's not here yet, so how can I gamble on having my fleet moving towards natural gas? So we'll take a look at this and try to decide what are some of the ways that this is getting fixed and the drivers behind this whole new era for marine. First, we actually had a true step change in September of last year. Wartzilla and Shell signed a joint cooperation multi-year agreement where they would bring their gas into the marketplace for the marine segment especially. This is significant because Shell brings certainty to the gas supply and as we know, certainty breeds investment. Now we're facing many of the owners with, with Shell going forward and this partnership creates a very, very compelling message that investment's okay, it's not risky. Next, why? Why is LNG becoming the choice preferred fuel for owners? It really comes down to the pocketbook. Most owners are driven by their pocketbooks. Washington State Ferries, for instance, made a presentation in August here in Houston. Their Assistant Secretary of Transportation, David Mosley, whose sole focus is the ferry fleet. One of his slides start out with why? To save money. Why is that so important? One of the world's top four ferry fleets is going to convert to natural gas. By the way, he carries 12 million trucks and cars and 23 million passengers a year, so it's not a small ferry operation. 20-some ferries. His current diesel price under contract is 337 not in volume. He's looking at almost saving half. Prices he was quoted for natural gas are $1.05 to $1.32 a gallon. Using the equivalency, as we know, because an energy density difference is a multiplier of 1.7, works out to 224 a gallon equivalent energy basis to diesel. That's a big savings over his contracted price of 337, over $1.23 a gallon today. He burns tens of millions of gallons of fuel. So not only is LNG a clean burning fuel, it helps the pocketbook significantly. So this really comes down, there's five principal drivers behind this new shift towards natural gas. First, shale gas. We are blessed with an abundance of shale gas here trailing out to more than 100 years supply, which gives, in fact, energy security. It's available and it's affordable. Why is it available today? Because of three principal factors. Directional drilling, hydraulic fracturing, which allows them to improve the porosity and get the gas from the field. And the third reason is computational capability. The second largest computer capabilities in the world behind the U.S. Defense Department is the oil and gas energy business. They have the second largest capacity computing power. So those things have really brought shale gas forward. And how about timelines? We have here in the U.S. EPA mandates, and those mandates are set at specific points in time. And those time points set the investment clock. Why? You have to adhere to different changes. Fuel sulfur content, there's also a geographic emissions bubble that's coming into as a control area. And thirdly, very stringent, ever tighter engine emission requirements. Tier two, three, and four will be existing for the smaller category two engines, while the larger category three engines will move from tier two to tier three. Again, more restrictions. These are the five drivers. They're not gonna change, they're fundamentals. Taking a quick look at the shale gas plays in the United States and Canada, we have tremendous reserves and natural gas that are being tapped today. In Canada, Balkans, Woodford, Barnett, Eagleford, Haynesville, 
Marcellus, Fayetteville, Woodford. Tremendous opportunities. For instance, if you took just the Marcellus play alone, it is huge. Marcellus could power the entire globe's energy needs for two full years. Everything. Petroleum, natural gas, hydro, uh, nuclear, ga uh, gas, biofuel, solar. Everything in the whole world can be powered out of that one field for two full years globally. So we have tremendous reserves that are being tapped in today and bringing a big change. If you look back from 1990, shale gas was virtually nothing until five years ago. It began to erupt, and now it represents about 25% of our local domestic gas supply. It will grow to almost 50% in the next 20 years looking out. That's a tremendous change. It has political repercussions. It has security rep repercussions. And it's going to help push our economy forward with low-cost energy. That's why chemical industries are relocating to the United States. That's why steel industries are relocating to the United States, because of the power and energy in shale is looking to be long-term a big benefit to these industries. Remember the chart we had of the different fields? Let's take a quick look at that one more time. The major fields, Woodford, Barnett, Fayetteville, Marcellus, Haynesville. Let's see where they're contributing to that huge growth. 2000 to 2005, we had 17% compound annual growth. Now that's pretty healthy. But look what happened. Just a few years ago, it accelerated. Now it's at a frantic 48% compound annual growth rate. That's, that's Microsoft. So we have an industry that was doing quite well with Barnett being the major field. And now all of a sudden we've got Fayetteville, Woodford in yellow, Haynesville in hot pink, and Marcellus in brown just beginning to really take off. Remembering, Marcellus, the brown one, will become the granddaddy of all. There was tremendous surge going forward in gas. So with all the surge, it looks like gas prices are going to continue to be, remain rather soft. In 2009, the forecast from the EIA predicted gas prices would approach $9 by 2030. Progressive forecasts brought it down in 2010 and in 2011, they're looking at around 7. What a great picture for the economics to prove that gas seems to be even a better bargain and a stronger business case going forward in the next two decades. The Energy Information Agency. Locally, we can take a quick look that gas has been hovering from four to five dollars per millimeter, and it's fallen off. Now it's right around two. If you look at the previous chart, you can see that two has not been seen for almost two decades. But at two dollars a million BTU, that's twenty-eight cents a gallon, equal to forty-eight cents a gallon diesel equivalency. What a true bargain! If that's true, it means there's ample opportunity for businesses to liquefy natural gas transport it into the marketplace, and still provide a profit while getting a fairly low-cost fuel as a substitute for a distillate. There's a fundamental change in the value of how gas has been considered relative to diesel or fuel. Historically, there was a 6 to 1 ratio. The reason for that was a barrel oil had 6 million BTU approximately. Barrel oil divided by 6 gives you the dollars per million BTU on gas. Today, a barrel is about $100, $105. That means $17.33 is the price for natural gas. But it isn't. It's two. So that 6 to 1 ratio has been broken. It went to 12 to 1. Now it's above 22 to 1. And the EIA has proclaimed that this ratio is broken. Therefore, gas is truly a bargain. will become even more preferred going into the future. Why might that be the case? Gas has a much lower energy, energy density. So it tends to not be as good in highly mobile platforms such as aircraft. You'll never see natural gas on your jet aircraft. You will find highly refined jet A fuels. So I think some of the reasons is, is its ability to, to work. How about the emissions control area in the United States and Canada? This goes out 200 miles off the coast and encapsulates everything in between, virtually enveloping us. It went into effect August of last year. There's a 12-month grace period that's enforced August of this year. If you're not in compliance, it's enforced August of this year. That's in uh, two and a half months. 
that's a big pressure change. How about the fuel sulfur standards? Here we got the emission control area. Here we got the global standards. Look at the difference. Today we're at 1% in the emission control area going to one tenth, one tenth of 1% 1 in 2015. That's January 1. At that point in time, you'll be competing with other transport modes for low one tenth sulfur content fuel. Well, trucks, trains will be buying it and you'll be competing. So there'll be stress on the supply. Globally, it's at 4.5% to 3.5% and by 2020, we'll go a half of a percent, provided that refineries say they can get there. And in 2018, they'll check. They might let it slip five years. That says engine after treatment, other controls. Why is that a burden? You've got space, responsibilities, a new system, people to maintain and operate it. And we don't have a lot of space on vessels. So now you're going to put after treatment and other things on place. Well, that's a real burden. So here are your five game changers. Two that are shale, a bargain, the fact it's all over the U.S. in spades for centuries of supply, then three EPA mandates. Sulfur content, geographic bubble encapsulating us with tight requirements, and of course, progressive changes in engine emissions themselves. This sets the investment time clock. This makes it possible. The economics are going to drive this first, second, and third. Lastly is the good emissions control picture. So the key question is, do we really have a chicken and the egg anymore? Well, it's time for chicken omelets. Because if you solve the problem, we have shale, shale gas coming to the market with big suppliers like Shell stepping forward and the others as well. We've got owners wanting to do this. You have the pressure point of the EPA. The time clock is set. It's not going to change. Do you have any questions? I gladly take some questions from the group now, and then I'll be here for another hour for individual questions. Anyone have a question?